Hello, this is Chuck Stahl looking at natural monopoly in policy. Antitrust, while a powerful tool, is not always appropriate, and that's particularly true in cases of natural monopoly. In the 1800s, railroads were extremely important to national economies, um, and many places found that they had a single railroad connecting uh, any two particular cities or two particular points. And that, of course, um, was a case of natural monopoly. Now, the historic responses to railroad natural monopolies took a couple of important um, forms. In the U.S., the tendency was towards regulation of prices. So the Texas Railroad Commission that we talked about uh, regarding the oil industry um, regulated railroad prices within the state. The Interstate Commerce Commission, formed in 1887, regulated railroad rates nationally. Uh, and that agency lasted um, over 100 years until it was abolished in 1995. Initially, the courts restricted some of these regulations, but Congress added explicit controls, um, and eventually uh, some of the regulation extended to other industries like trucking. Um, the United Kingdom had a uh, fairly similar and even earlier regulatory policy with the 1844 Rail Railways Act, which controlled the rates of uh, trains in their country. Now, other European countries followed alternative solutions. Sweden went with public ownership. The Royal Railway Committee, formed in 1888, became the Swedish State Railroads, known as SJ, or Staten's Janvager. Um, apologies for those who speak Swedish. Uh, France had a public railroad in 1878 with private competitors. Uh, and Germany uh, was not even a country at that time, but Prussia had a public or nationalized railroad in the 1870s, and Bavaria had the Royal Bavarian State Railways. Now, over time, many countries, both in Europe and uh, the United States, railroad ownership uh, has changed between public and private ownership, and in some countries that has happened repeatedly. Let me look a little more broadly at natural monopoly. Natural monopoly exists whenever economies of scale are so big that a single firm can serve the entire market. Right? So then it would be lower cost for one firm than for two or more firms. Again, we're looking at cost, not necessarily price. And there are many examples uh, of this um, natural monopoly. Oil pipelines, electrical distribution, natural gas distribution, landline telephones, drinking water, sewage systems, these all have in common high indivisible fixed costs, which means that building that network is very expensive to start with, or building, building that system is very expensive, um, and it's cheaper to have a single system rather than to have duplicative infrastructure. So antitrust is not a good solution to natural monopoly problems. If we break these companies up, we have small, high-cost firms, society is worse off. And entry does not provide a long-run check on monopoly power. These firms can be resistant to entry because they have a, a big cost advantage. Even creating a new competitor is an inefficient use of resources, although it could be better than having an unregulated monopoly. So there are alternatives to antitrust. Uh, one is economic regulation, and the second is public ownership. So let me turn to economic regulation. In the United States, um, even at the time of the Sherman Act, natural monopoly was seen as a reason not to break up some um, dominant firms or firms dominated by a single industry. And instead, we saw a growth of different regulatory agencies. Uh, under economic regulation, the government approves prices, services, um, and rate of return uh, on capital. Since this was uh, widespread in the United States, um, typically we had both state and federal regulatory control. So telephone service prices um, were approved at the federal level by the FCC, or Federal Communications Commission. And then each state had a public utility commission or public service commission um, also setting uh, rates within the state. Uh, electricity and natural gas, at the federal level, it was the Federal Energy 
uh, Regulatory Commission or FERC, and then those same state public uh, utility commissions uh, setting prices for those energy um, goods. Uh, rail railroads, as mentioned, um, were controlled by the Interstate Commerce Commission nationally, um, and trucking later became controlled by um, Interstate Commerce Commission, who would set the price for particular goods being trucked to particular or to any particular spot. Uh, airline prices were also controlled by the federal government, by the um, Civil Aeronautics Board or the CAB. And in practice, prices for goods in these industries or services in these industries were determined by negotiation between the firm and the regulatory agency. So let me turn to the theory of price regulation. Now, as we um, have talked about many times in this class, uh, monopolies left unchecked will charge prices that are substantially higher than the um, competitive price or than the socially optimal price. A monopolist will look at the intersection of marginal cost and marginal revenue, use that to choose its optimal quantity, and then price all the way up on, on the demand curve. Um, and so here we have an example of a monopoly price a graph that you've seen several times in this class. Now, the ideal price would be to set price equal to marginal cost. So in that case, that would be where demand and marginal cost intersect. Um, so that would be our theoretic or socially optimal. This will maximize consumer and producer surplus combined. Um, and again, this is something that is fairly familiar to you. So we look at the intersection of the demand curve, the marginal cost curve. We set our optimal price, P star, and we'll have the quantity uh, where that intersection is. Now there's two problems with this. Uh, one, in practice, it may be difficult to determine marginal cost. But the second, and the one that is uh, a problem even in theory, is that in many cases in these kinds of industry, marginal cost may be substantially less than average total cost. And that's going to be true particularly in industries where we have a high level of fixed cost. So if we set a regulated price at the P star as shown in this graph, the firm will lose money on every single unit it sells. And in the long run, we'll have a bankrupt monopoly um, right, that can't remain in business. So there was an alternative that was used um, in terms of uh, actual price regulation because of this problem of marginal cost pricing. And this is known as Ramsey pricing, and it's a form of uh, average cost pricing. So Ramsey cost pricing is seen as second best. It, the idea is to produce um, or to choose prices uh, as close as possible to the marginal cost price subject to break even. Right, and that means that price needs to be based on average total cost. The firm needs to fully cover its cost in order to remain in business. Um, so this, of course, allows the companies to stay in business. And it also has a practical advantage in that average prices can be easier to observe. So if you look at our Ramsey pricing graph, you can see the price was selected uh, where the demand curve intersected with the average total cost curve. That way the firm would break even, fully covering its fixed cost and variable cost and earning a normal rate of return. Um, so it's not as high as the high monopoly price that we had looked at in the very first graph, um, but it's not as low as the marginal cost pricing uh, or ideal price um, that we looked at in the previous graph. So, Price regulation is fairly straightforward in theory, um, but it's very complicated in practice. Uh, in order to really set prices, um, the regulatory agencies needed to have a large amount of information. Um, but the firms have had an incentive to shape regulation to their own benefits, typically to push prices upward. Um, and the firms control much of that important information needed um, about costs. Um, in order to set those the, the prices. So the actual regulation was much less efficient than theory suggested. Another problem with economic regulation is that 
the industry and the regulatory agency become very interconnected. The um, individuals working for the agency need to have the same training and, and expertise as those working in the firms. And individual employees and managers uh, may move from the firms to the agencies and from the agencies back to the firms. And what seems to have happened is that over time, the industry becomes the most influential party in determining what the regulations look like. And that's known as capture. So capture is when the industry takes control of the regulators. And if that happens, there can be all kinds of um, anti-competitive issues. The firms can use regulation as an anti-competitive device. They may outlaw or restrict entry by other companies. They may um, regulate substitutes, uh, reducing competition. That certainly seems to be what happened in terms of the railroads extending regulatory power um, to the trucking industry, which was in no way a natural monopoly. Um, Firms within an industry may be able to use price regulation to eliminate uh, price competition within the industry, essentially acting, having the government act as a cartel enforcement. And there have been cases where the regulatory agencies seem to tax others in order to subsidize um, firms. And so by the end of the 20th century, the problems of regulation were widespread. There was a strong economic case against regulation, and the politics turned against regulation. And in the 80s and 90s, there was a big move to deregulate uh, railroads, trucks, airfares. Uh, we still have some regulation of electricity and natural gas and, um, and telephone, um, but deregulation became much more popular um, than the regulation that had become important 100 years earlier. Let me turn now to the um, other alternative, right, which is public ownership. So sometimes this is called nationalization or public provision of goods, socialism. The idea is that if something is uh, publicly owned, it could produce efficiently and price at the socially optimal price. Right, the public enterprise are not necessarily profit maximizing, but they can maximize social welfare. And this was once widely used in Europe for telephone service, rail, airlines, uh, but less important in the United States. We do see some um, uh, public ownership, the post office. Um, we see a lot of public ownership, not at federal, but at the municipal level. Um, so water systems, sewage systems are often owned by cities uh, or local governments. And about 25% of electricity in the United States is produced um, under public ownership. Um, so lots of local systems and then the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, having uh, federal ownership um, of electricity in a particular region of the U.S. And uh, statistically, those publicly owned uh, electric companies have lower prices. Now, public ownership also is not without its problems. Uh, the managerial incentives often are at, at odds with the uh, goal of maximizing public welfare. We can look to the Flint water crisis all public ownership, just to see an example of how badly decisions can go. Often the managerial incentives are to maximize political support, and that might mean um, keeping prices low and changing them less frequently um, than they should be, simply to keep public support. They may also have uh, the goal of making the life for managers easier, um, to have fewer complaints, better pay, less work, less job turnover, but the kinds of issues that we um, often see uh, in monopolies. And public monopolies, just like private monopolies, suffer from the absence of market discipline. Right? Without competition, costs may rise. Um, there's perhaps less incentive to invest in new technologies. And here, even a merger can't replace bad management because it's owned by the government. Um, and so while public ownership in theory could work well, often publicly owned firms were much less productive than, um, than was optimal or than was theoretically possible. Just to return to the Swedish state railroads, uh, 
to look at um, where they were by the end of the 20th century. And this is just a quote. With no proper governance or transparency, SJ grew into an inefficient and unwieldy conglomerate. Although organizationally it was still a government agency, owning diverse assets from restaurants, casinos, and hotels, to ships and buses, besides its core retail, uh, core rail-related operations. Um, and it really was seen as an unsuccessful company. And in 1988, they opened up the sector to competition. They split the, um, the track ownership from the trains. The trains were um, also divided passenger and cargo, and SJ was forced to divorce, uh, to divest itself of ferries and bus lines. Um, so public ownership also has its issues, and Sweden was not alone. Many countries um, have abandoned public ownership in the last few decades. Uh, we've seen a big move towards privatization. Um, BP, the British Petroleum Company, had been state-owned, uh, was privatized in 79, British Telecom privatized in 98, British Airways um, privatized in 1987. Now, sometimes privatization was due to ideology, and sometimes it was for efficiency in some combination, uh, sometimes a, a combination of the two, and sometimes it was simply for revenue that the governments could make money from selling a public company and use that in lieu of taxes. Uh, and so we've had this, in um, certain places, a cycle between uh, nationalization and privatization, and sometimes that um, has been repeated um, back and forth over time. This has been Chuck Stahl from Kalamazoo College talking about natural monopoly and policy responses. Thank you for listening.